as I said uh, this afternoon, we're going to be uh, continuing on with our discussion of experimental methods um, for fireball cracking. And uh, we'll get uh, fairly deep into a wide variety of techniques here. And then the last part, um, 30, 40 minutes, we'll look at the motion of non-tracer particles uh, in terms of flows. Um, Shima uh, reminded me on the way up that not everybody knew what the uh, Taylor Reynolds number is. So um, there's, this is nothing deep. This is just a experimentalist convention for the way we typically uh, report um, Reynolds numbers. And why did it happen? Well, there's some historical reasons, plus the fact that we'd rather not keep track of 10 to the 6th all the time. And, uh, and our lambda being the square root of the more traditional Reynolds number is the that's typically used in experimental variables. So here's some numbers referenced, and I'll refer to it a few times uh, through my talk. But the main uh, thing I wanted to start off with is a little bit of a caveat that uh, talking about experiments is tough um, because, you know, we're an experiment. We spend our lives on it, and it's a 3D time-dependent thing that to uh, come to understand, you kind of have to do yourself or, and uh, at least go to the lab and experience it in 3D. Um, so I'll try to do my best to uh, talk us through a variety of these experimental techniques, and hopefully you can be engaged with your imagination, because a lot of this requires you to visualize what's going on um, in 3D beyond what I can show on the screen. So I briefly mentioned at the end of last time a couple of the early Lagrangian experiments that uh, Richardson had done with balloon tracking the atmospheric boundary layer. There was another uh, version of this experiment that was actually done much more carefully in the 80s, where they actually put radio transponders in the balloons and uh, again looked at um, uh, they looked at Richardson's version. They also looked at the Lagrangian uh, structure function. But it's just tough to work in the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, I'll focus my discussion on uh, laboratory measurements. And we talked about this experiment a little bit, uh, where they were tracking with uh, resolution only able to resolve the large scales in the flow um, of the particle. Um, but now let me uh, introduce what will be one of the main methods that uh, I'll talk about here, which is uh, often called 3D particle tracking ball symmetry. Uh, it was developed, well, it's one of these ideas that is uh, so straightforward, it's been used many times. But the real development for the fluid dynamics community came from, uh, from uh, the Dracos group at ETH in the mid-90s. And the idea is simple. We have a volume in the center of our uh, turbulent flow. And for, you can think of any turbulent flow for now. This is a flow between oscillating grids that uh, Otten Mann had built. Um, but uh, just because it was a nice picture. But then we have some detection volume in the center of the flow. We use some illumination method to uh, put light onto tracer particles that are being ejected by the flow. We have to be sure the tracer particles are small enough that they're following the flow. And then we set multiple cameras up to image this volume. And then the challenge is to re reconstruct the 3D trajectories of the particles, emissions and velocities, accelerations if you uh, want to go that way, from the, uh, from the measurements on these individual cameras. So uh, the, the geometry making sense. So on each of these cameras, we get a 2D image. There's a projection of the particles that are seen in this volume. And then we have those 2D images from each of four cameras. And we want to reconstruct uh, what the particle positions are. And then from multiple frames, we can reconstruct velocities. So here's a question just to get you thinking about the geometry of this kind of a problem. Um, when you think about imaging, one of the big challenges we're going to have is to take these 2D images from these cameras and turn them into 3D coordinates. And the question is, how many parameters do I have to measure to specify a camera's viewpoint? Have you thought about that? If you give somebody a world and you say where you're going to put a camera, how many parameters do you have to specify that camera to tell what image it's going to see? Here, put the boat up here, but take a minute or two and convince your neighbor of the number you want. Okay, I hear six. Uh, anybody uh, want to argue for uh, something else? Sold. Any other comments? No. No. Go ahead and talk to your neighbors if you want. Uh, it's we get in a, I want to get people engaged in the wake after uh, after lunch here. I don't think six is the right answer, by the way. 
There's some caveats you can add. I'm thinking about the simple geometry optics limit where you don't have to worry about camera aberrations. If you start that, there's no Okay, so Dan says he's going to argue for six. Okay, so, so I would... I would suppose that you have to have three coordinates for the location of the camera. And then once I have the location of the camera, I can point side to side, I can point up and down, I can rotate it on axis. Okay. This is, uh, these are definitely the main six. Anybody want to argue for another one? Yes. Okay. Well, this would be the seventh I would add. I'm presuming right. I could focus the camera, so I was just going to, but I guess all these are adjustable. You can focus sense. the camera, right. but ultimately you need some number to convert pixel coordinates into real space coordinates. And you can define that in a variety of ways. Um, you can define where the distance to a focal plane um, and, a, and a focal length of the camera, um, or you can just define a, a magnification that gives you that conversion. But as I understand it, you need at least seven parameters for the um, pinhole camera. Um, and now that's, of course, not the whole story when you get into real experiments. Um, because there are always optical distortions. And we're going to be tracking these particles to microns from distances of half a meter. And so uh, optical distortions become important. Um, in a system like this, where you're viewing the cameras obliquely through the plexiglass, you get some significant optical distortions you have to take account of. If you're careful and be sure that you have ports so all your cameras can view perpendicularly to the air uh, fluid interface, or water interface in my case usually, then uh, you can get by with minimal distortion parameters, although um, depending on how good your lens is, you may want to include a radial distortion parameter when you're viewing a larger volume. And then some people will include 10 parameters here. But the point is, when you want to use this, somehow you have to precisely measure these so that you can reconstruct positions in here to 10 microns, let's say, um, from a distance of half a meter. And so there's a, a, lot, a significant challenge in running these experiments in getting the calibrations in the first place and in um, maintaining them stable to do the experiments. Okay, let's see, other things I wanted to mention about uh, the, the basic idea here at this point. I think let's leave it and I'll go on to talking about what kind of requirements we have on the cameras in order to be able to um, resolve particle trajectories in these kind of flows. So, first of all, for our spatial resolution, we'd like to be able to resolve all the scales and turbulence. And so here in, this is the number of pixels in one direction that I'm going to need. And that's going to be re related to the ratio between the large scale that I want to resolve and the <coughs> Kolmogorov scale. And if I use this large scale as the stirring scale, I can use the standard argument here. Here's the Kolmogorov length. Here's turning the energy dissipation into large scale variables. And then I get this Reynolds number to the three quarter number that I think we've run into a couple of times already that uh, says how the range of scales of the flow increases with Reynolds number. So if I just put the numbers in, that's about 4,000 pixels in one direction at R lambda 1,000. So I'd like to have a camera that's giving me 4,000 by 4,000 pixels to resolve um, the range of scales that exist in, uh, in a flow at this uh, Reynolds number. I use that as a reference because that's often where um, atmospheric turbulence starts and where you often have a pretty well defined uh, inertial range. But I make many measurements in my lab at R lambda 200, where we can get by with lower resolution. Um, that just comes down to what you need. Then the, question, the next question is the temporal resolution that you need. And this has often been a bigger problem. So you want your frame period to be on the order of the Kolmogorov time. And now to define the Kolmogorov time, we have to know what our energy dissipation rate is. That depends on the length scale here, energy dissipation rate is u cubed on L. This depends on the details about your apparatus. And this depends on the fluid you use. But for a typical apparatus that fits in a uh, typical lab, by which I mean the apparatus is a few meters with uh, large length scales of tens of centimeters, um, here's a typical uh, plot of what the Kolmogorov scale as a function of R lambda looks like, the Kolmogorov time scale. And the first thing you notice is it's rapidly decreasing. So if you go stick at very low Reynolds numbers, you can get by with very slow cameras. But if we want to, say, uh, use a very simple fluid water here, which has um, a very nice low viscosity, and we want to get to R lambda 1,000, we're less than a millisecond here on our, um, on our time scales. And, well, you can go to air, but you lose, um, you can go to air, but your facility has to be quite a bit larger because kinematic viscosity is uh, lower, uh, is higher. Um, then there are people who are doing exotic things. There's a, um, 
some a terminal facility being built with helium at CERN, and there's a terminal facility I'll show you a little bit about in Göttingen that uses pressurized sulfur hexafluoride, and these are fluids that allow you to have slightly larger Kolmogorov scales at a specific Reynolds number, but it's still a problem. You're still, for almost all of these, um, working in the range of, this thing is starting to give me trouble. Let me grab mine a bit. You're working in the range where um, you need millisecond time resolution, and so we need kilohertz uh, frame rates. So quick calculation, that's 16 gigabytes a second that you need to come into your camera. Um, is that bad? Yeah, it's not a great deal, right? Um, although current cameras, the current state of the art, are just going above 10 gigabytes a second that you can get off of the camera. So we're getting to the point where we can do this. You pay on the order of $100,000 for a camera that will give you order 10 gigabytes a second off. So we're getting to the point where cameras can resolve this. <coughs> I have a question. No, well, just just a comment that, that I guess that uh, Enrico has been working on the idea that another fluid could be useful for these things and is relatively easy to deal with is liquid uh, nitrogen, huh? which has a, a viscosity uh, lower than water, significantly lower than water, but maybe higher than water. And uh, so it's in that, within that range, it's pretty easy huh? to deal with. It's cheap. There's a, there's been a lot of different. Um, uh, proposals here, and of course, then people pressurize these to get different uh, different variables and all. Question? Does it not make sense to just have a few different sets of cameras that can then, you know, just... interlace? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, this uh, idea has been used a little bit, but the problem is it gets you uh, algebraic increases. You get a factor of two, three, four, and then you wait four years, and the one camera could do what the four did. Does that make sense? So in practice, we just do what we can do with one camera at each viewpoint wait four years. And, uh, and wait four years to do the next higher Reynolds number or something like that. Is it really necessary to resolve the Kolmogorov scale? It's usually the smallest at this scale is like of the order of several to the, scale, like eight or ten. This is a great question. It depends on the details of what you want to measure. If you want to measure velocity gradients, your camera resolution has to be actually quite a bit smaller than the, the Kolmogorov scale because you want to measure um, velocity gradients that are linear over maybe five eta but you need several measurements along that, and you usually need several pixels to measure a particle. So in practice, you may need to go quite a bit smaller than this to resolve the, um, the smallest scales. Um, but what we do in that case is, if we want to resolve the velocity gradients, we just accept that we aren't going to resolve that, and you zoom in and image a small region of your flow. Right. And then if you want to resolve all the large scale properties, you simply accept that you aren't going to resolve the Kolmogorov plane. Um, so that, that, this is what you do in practice. You get whatever camera you can afford, and you find physics that you can do resolving that range of length scales. So, but back uh, when I was, uh, if you'll indulge me here, I'll do a little bit of history that I think is cool. I think maybe you'll find interesting. When I was first getting into this in the uh, middle, mid-90s, um, this 10 gigabytes a second question was just way out of the question. We were very happy to have uh, 60 hertz cameras, and you could get an expensive one that did 400 hertz at 640 by 480. Um, and so when you do these calculations um, at that point, it was just prohibitive to do this, and we would have just not done the measurements, except we ran into some co colleagues at Cornell who had uh, just finished an upgrade to the High Energy Physics Collider, and they had a bunch of these spare detectors lying around, the silicon strip detectors, along with the expertise to teach us to make them. And we found that we could use these to build images that got a 70,000 image per second with 512 pixel spatial resolution across, um, which is still better than you can do with the state-of-the-art um, digital uh, camera at the moment. The reason you can do that is very simple. It's reading out a 1D projection of the light that strikes it rather than giving you pixel-based. So you have an immediate factor of 512 decrease in the amount of data that you have to read off. Um, the drawback then is that you can't have very many particles on here before you get confused. Um, but the advantage is, well, if you go to low particle densities, you can record these trajectories with very high spatial and time resolution. So these are uh, a lot of fun. Um, you know, they just have them as individual components. We built the board, glued them down, and then you have to go in, and each one of these strips has to be wire bonded over to each one of the RC chips, and then each one of the RC chips wire bonded over to each one of the uh, detectors. So it's quite satisfying to build your own imager. Um, to do this. Of course, I can tell you about the details when I went to Kirsten too. But here's the, uh, here's the way that these things get used in uh, practice. This is the Clio 3 vertex detector at the Cornell Electron Positron Collider. And can you see each one of these little rectangles there? It's one of those silicon strip detectors that I just showed you. 
So they come in ladders, a strip of them like this, a strip of them like this. There's actually four concentric cylinders. You only see the outside one here. And then these get inserted here into the collider, and the electrons and positrons come in and annihilate in the center of the, um, the cylinder. And then the, whatever you call it, uh, how did Nigel say it? Uh, high energy physicists crash things together, see what comes out, and that's uh, the way they do physics. And so then each one of those pieces that comes out, they want to track back to where it came from, that vertex, where the particle decayed, maybe it's a piece bar or something like this. So this is the way they use them, and we just uh, took one of them out and used it for a high-speed um, imager. Here's a setup that uh, we, we had running. So here's one strip detector looking this way. There's another one hiding behind here that allowed us to have two coordinates measured with this direction and one coordinate measured here. So you get three coordinates of the, um, of the position of particles moving in our tank. This tank is the French washing machine, the counter-rotating disk plug. You shoot a, beam, a laser beam through and illuminate it and image out onto the two cameras. It's relatively straightforward, but, um, but maybe not to build. The, um, just a quick calculation so that I've been giving you ideas about data rates. Um, and that is that uh, if you had done what the data rates that we're doing with, uh, with pixel-based imagers, you'd have a data rate coming off at 15 gigabytes a second. So that's a little bit above what uh, current technology can do. And we were doing this in the mid-90s. So here's the kind of data you get off of one of these strip detectors. Here's a raw re representation of the raw data. Sorry, the 512 got uh, blocked off there. But these are 512 pixels along this line. And then here's time, just uh, frames that we took at uh, 70 kilohertz. And here you see a particle, which is a bright spot that is uh, traveling along the detector. And you get position versus time from this. You just find the centroid at each time to get the position versus time. And then here's a case where your data is good enough. You can go in and measure derivatives. We get the velocity from that. And it's relatively smooth. But we were interested in accelerations. So then you wonder about this. Can we actually measure the acceleration from this? And taking two derivatives of this data is a challenging operation. But we did succeed in demonstrating that we could extract um, second derivatives from these uh, position versus time data. One of the real requirements of this is that we're, um, this high frame rate allowed us to record, I think, 20 pictures per chromograph time in this data set. So you could uh, do some time averaging and do better than the individual positions. So that's the kind of data you get out of these 1D imagers. And then here is what a uh, representation of a three-dimensional trajectory recorded by three imagers is. A particle swirling through the turbulent flow. And uh, we put one of these dots every 10 frames, I guess, uh, along, or eight frames. Um, along the um, picture, and you, of course, pick out one that has a nice vortex um, because it looks cool. Many of the trajectories are relatively straight curves, and um, the, the, the kind of things you would get. So this uh, acceleration event, if you notice, has uh, regions where the acceleration goes up to 16,000 meters per second squared. Um, turbulence can be a very violent phenomenon on these uh, very small length scales. But let's keep our focus. Uh, well, okay, let me say, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a variety of different measurement techniques. And in most cases, I'll give one result or so that they measure with it to uh, give a sense of the kind of quantities that can be measured. I looked at the uh, acceleration variance, uh, the, the second moment of the acceleration, a little bit this morning. Um, now, here's the full probability distribution of the acceleration measured with this strip detector system for three different Reynolds numbers, ranging across a pretty good range. And the thing you note, if you get used to looking at these distributions on a log linear scale, this has very long tails out here. You have significant probabilities of finding particles out at more than 20 sigma um, in, these, in this system. And you can compare this to other uh, statistics. This has, has significantly stronger tails than the velocity gradients um, do, and it's somewhat stronger than the passive scalar. The acceleration is one of the most intermittent quantities in a turbulent flow. But if you took another time derivative, it would get worse. <laughs> that, that may be true. I'm not uh, worried too much about what do they call it? Oh, oh, jerk. Jerk. Although, although the, you know, the fact that this is different than the velocity gradient is so they're the same number of derivatives. Right. It's the same. So this is the, the small scale quantity in the Lagrangian perspective, just like the velocity derivative and the small scale quantity in the Eulerian perspective. And there's something about the intermittency of this transport phenomenon that is uh, stronger than the intermittency of uh, the shear phenomena in the flows. OK, well, that's all I wanted to say about that. Feel free to jump in at any point. Um, if you have any questions, I'm not. I'm going to only be able to give uh, a few of the main points about each of these flow, about each of these measurement techniques. Is there a theory for 
there was quite a bit of discussion about um, what kind of theories would produce this. Yes, um, Reynolds did some work in the, uh, 10 years ago with some proposals. I wouldn't say there's anything very fundamental, uh, but there are some phenomenological models that give you ideas about what these tails should look like. And the quality of the data, even they made better measurements out here, out down to 10 to the 8. Um, and the quality of the data, I don't think, is really good enough to distinguish between this simple parameterization which, of a stretched exponential and the various power laws times exponentials that people have proposed as the uh, alternative. It's really hard to, uh, to conclude a lot about functional form out here. We're quite confident that it converges, meaning that the second, I mean, that, it, that it's not Lorentzian, that the second moment of the acceleration exists. But um, the exact functional form out here is still debated. They have definitely thought about it. I don't know what they developed theories for the acceleration PDF, um, but they've done some things that I haven't always kept track of. Um, but I think that's, I think that, you know, there are a few other people. Um, Beck, um, Jerome Beck, Jeremy Beck yeah. did some nice work on this. Uh, it's always PDF. Yeah. So just, just a, a positive comment that, you know, we've looked a lot of the week at these various higher moments of velocity differences. And in some sense, those are just moments of some probability distribution mm -hmm. that's not being seen. Yeah. And it's, so it's nice to just look at the distribution itself, I think. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I have a nice plot here in a couple slides that will uh, I can pick up on that point um, with. Go. Uh, I don't understand how you put these tracks uh, in the experiment to get a three-dimensional. Uh, okay. Good. Um, so we're looking from two directions, and that very quickly allows you to get two coordinates, right? And now the question is, how do you get the third? The way we did it is we put a beam splitter on one of the optical axes and then configured a script detector that was orthogonal to the other one along that axis. Does that make sense? So it effectively, I was measuring two coordinates out along this axis, and the third coordinate out on this axis. You would get two coordinates from a simple CCD imager, and we just used two uh, linear detectors to get it, and one out here. So you can build it up like that. This works as long as you only have a single particle in view. If you get very many particles in view, this kind of a method of just using three linear detectors to find them it runs into ambiguity problems. But we just ran this experiment at low seating densities for the strip detectors. OK, so let me uh, introduce the next technique, which is a really beautiful method of particle tracking that was developed in Jean-Francois Pinton's group in, uh, at Inercion in France. And uh, they also use a uh, French washing machine. Um, some people ask why this flow keeps reappearing. I think the answer is that it's one of the easiest flows to make very high Reynolds numbers in a very small space. Um, I think that ultimately is the reason why this flow had appeared. It's nasty in terms of some inhomogeneities, but it's easy to make uh, high Reynolds numbers that you can get close to with your detection system. So here's the method they use of acoustic particle tracking. They put an emitter here, emitting 2.5 megahertz uh, acoustic waves into the system, and then they put a receiver where um, both of them are these phased arrays of uh, uh, either emitters or sensors that allow them to detect the acoustic signal coming back. Then you can use the relative phasing between these to pick out only um, a sound that has come from a cone in your system. And that's very important because this uh, method has a lot of acoustic reflections in the system, and you need to be able to um, beam your detection by doing a phase array. Um, and then you can, from the uh, detection, from the relative phase on different ones of these uh, detectors, now is it clear here? This is a detector that sits here. And from the relative uh, phase, of the signal at each of these detectors, I can get an uh, estimate of where a particle lies out in, uh, in this B. Um, so that gives us position. And then I can use the Doppler shift um, to give the velocity along an axis um, perpendicular, the perpendicular axis here. So each one of these gives us one component of the velocity, and it can give us uh, two components of the position of the, um, and in fact, I think you get all three components of the position from just one of these uh, detectors. So then they put um, a couple of detectors in the system, and you can get two components of the velocity, and you can track your particles as a function of time. 
The nice thing is that Doppler measurement is giving a relatively direct measurement of velocity. You don't have to take a time derivative of a measured position to get a velocity with these acoustic track uh, systems. It was similar to laser Doppler that um, we talked about here the, uh, the other day, um, where it, when you use a Doppler signal, you get the frequency you get off is directed proportional to the velocity. So that is nice. Um, one of the drawbacks of this system is that in order to get a strong enough uh, signal from a particle, it requires a relatively large particle. You know, you'd like in this system, I think their Kolmogorov growth scale is uh, less than 100 microns. And so you put a particle in there that maybe is 50 or 75 microns. It just doesn't reflect enough acoustic energy to detect it out here. And so they put a lot of work into very low noise heterodyne systems to, um, to do the detection from as small a particles as they could get to. And here's a, t a data set that uh, comes from them. I showed it to you a little bit uh, before, but let me now uh, go through it in detail. So this is the Lagrangian velocity difference along a particle trajectory. Uh, this acoustic tracking system is very good for long time tracking, so it can take you way out into the large times where it becomes essentially Gaussian. And then as you use shorter and shorter time increments, this probability distribution of uh, velocity differences becomes more and more intermittent with stronger and stronger tails. And in the limit that this tail goes to zero, you should get to the acceleration distribution which is shown here in dotted line, this is actually from the Cornell measurements, that, uh, that just put it on top, to highlight the fact that these measurements are limited in terms of resolving the smallest scales, but they can resolve a, a large range across. And this was actually the first measurement in which people made uh, measurements of the Lagrangian structure function scaling exponents um, using these acoustic tracking system. Uh, but because they're limited in size scale, you can't get the full inertial range either. And so it's a very beautiful technique. It's been used uh, in a variety of other settings. Recently, some, a group has had a wind tunnel, and they have found a way to make helium bubbles that are neutrally buoyant in air. So if you're just very careful, you get the right amount of helium and the right amount of soap film, um, your helium bubble will be neutrally buoyant. And then they just eject these down with the wind tunnel turbulence, and then they have used this to track the, um, to, uh, to track, they've used this acoustic tracking system to uh, track these particles. This was Miguel Burgoyne um, in um, Grenoble, I guess. <clears throat> okay, so there's the acoustic tracking system. Um, wanted to now uh, mention some techniques that uh, Dan Lindbergh's group developed um, to measure the velocity gradient tensor. And this is just to highlight how, um, what a challenge it is to measure these small scales and how when you're clever you can come up with ways to do it. Um, what they have done is they have taken three laser sheets. So one laser sheet coming through here in this orientation, another perpendicular laser sheet here, a third perpendicular laser sheet there, and then they basically do PIV in each of these three laser sheets to obtain three perpendicular um, PIV fields. Okay? And now, if you work at small enough scales such that this whole box fits in within a few cone goroff lengths, you can assume that your velocity gradients are linear across this system, and you can extract from the velocity field just on these three surfaces what the full velocity gradient tensor is at this point. Plus, you get along the way, you get the, um, in addition to the velocity gradients, you get the velocity itself. And uh, Dan was just mentioning to me that here's a system that you can actually use to measure velocity. You have the velocity and all the velocity gradients. You can measure the vorticity, take the dot product of the velocity and the velocity gradient. And here's a, a method that works. Here's the flow that they did it in. They use oscillating grids, similar to the apparatus that I'm going to show a little later in our lab at, in Westland. Um, and they oscillate them up and down, image in this, uh, the region in between with four cameras. Anything else you want to say, Dan? Uh, I'll show some data in a minute. Three cameras. Oh, three cameras, right? Yeah, so it will be. Um, and, and Ben Zest's dissertation is online at my group. All right. So here's some data that they got from this. And since we've been looking at probability distributions in this set, section of the talk, I, I chose the plot that where they show the probability distribution of the energy dissipation. The, this is the instantaneous dissipation divided by epsilon bar, which is what I've been calling the energy dissipation um, in my lecture so far. And then they're also plotting the probability distribution of the entropy which is vorticity squared, um, whereas the energy dissipation is a strain rate squared, um, velocity, so the symmetric part of the velocity gradient and the anti-symmetric part. 
And then you plot a probability distribution of these square moments of the velocity gradient tensor. And what you see is that the um, vorticity, the entropy PDF out here, has longer, stronger tails than the um, energy dissipation does. So the vorticity is somewhat more intermittent than the energy dissipation. It has more of these large uh, deviation events. Both of these are less uh, intermittent than the passive scalar or the, um, or the acceleration. Okay, so the beauty of this technique is the access to the full velocity gradient tensor, which we have no chance of getting with our, our particle fraction measurements at high Reynolds numbers. We're lucky if we have one particle in a coma off length. Here they have to have enough to resolve uh, the velocity PID on each of those uh, three planes. Um, a drawback of this technique is because you need to get all of this within, let me go back, sorry. Because you need to get all of this within a few coma off lengths, you can't go to really high Reynolds numbers very easily because uh, as you increase the Reynolds number, the cold graph scale rapidly gets smaller if the apparatus is fixed. And uh, so they did these measurements at our lambda 50 something, um, which is quite a low Reynolds number. Um, and uh, to extend this up to high Reynolds numbers, I've actually thought about building this and I've concluded that it would be very difficult with the Reynolds number that I want to study. But I think it, it, it can be done. Uh, you just be careful with the optics. Okay, so now I want to come back to the um, group at ETH Zurich who developed these uh, 3D particle tracking techniques in the mid-90s. Um, and they have developed some new techniques that allow them to measure some very nice things. Um, here is an example of a new flow they have used where they use electromagnetic fields to force a low Reynolds number flow here. It's again only at R lambda 50. Um, but they use a scanning, um, PI, a scanning laser system that allows them to use a very high seating density um, to uh, extract the uh, particles in here. And uh, maybe that now would be a good time for me to mention something I didn't mention before. One of the problems with this um, stereoscopic um, particle tracking system that when you use multiple cameras to resolve what's going on in the center of a flow is that the way you find the particles in 3D is each camera sees a light spot and a light spot on a camera corresponds to a ray in space. So I don't know where that particle is, I just know that it's somewhere along that ray. Now I have another camera, it sees light spots, it has a ray in space. Where these two rays cross, that's a particle. But if I have a thousand particles on this camera and a thousand particles on this camera, it's not immediately obvious which particle here corresponds to which particle here. And so what you do is you go and draw the rays in space and find the, the, the rays that have the smallest intersection error, and you call that a particle. For two cameras, you can't do very high particle density in that case. Um, but if you add four cameras to the system, you have the redundancy to handle the case where maybe two particles lie along the line and you only see them as one particle on one camera, or a particle happens to be too dim to see. And so using uh, multiple cameras allows you to resolve this uh, stereoscopic, this stereoscopic matching problem. Um, the te technique they developed was stereoscopic matching is even easier if you go to very low Reynolds numbers and you take many pictures per, um, per time by scanning your laser beam across so you only see part of the particles in each uh, frame. So you're doing a kind of a mixed PIV 3D particle tracking uh, measurement, and the net result is you can do very high um, seating densities, and as long as you stay with low Reynolds numbers, you can time resolve the particle trajectories uh, through these systems. And they made what I, as far as I know, is the only experimental measurement of the Gauss degree strain tensor in a 3D turbulent flow. This is the logarithm of the eigenvalues of the stretching uh, matrix of the cauchy green strain tensor. And uh, so there's one extensional, and the intermediate one is just ma marginally extensional, and then a contracting eigenvector, and because of eigenvalue, and because of incompressibility, these have to add up um, to zero. So they're plotting the mean uh, eigenvalues here um, on this plot. So it can be done at very low level. But I guess this is, um this is not just the, the symmetric part of the gradient tensor, right? right? It's, it's the square of that, or...? No, so this is the Cauchy-Green strain tensor. They're actually doing what I talked about yesterday, right. where they follow the uh, collection follow of particles the in time, okay. and then you measure the, um, uh, the differential change in the final position with the differential change in the initial position, and extract that uh, Lagrangian um, stretch. And I guess that, in fact, is probably an integral of the symmetric part of the gradient yeah. matrix over that same path. Yes, that's right. Which has a similar eigenvalue structure. It, it's the yeah. individual matrices are distributed. By you it. have to be careful. You have to include both the vorticity and the stretching 
to be to see what how it orients, right? Because you can yeah, start to stretch and then you can the reorient. Yeah. You could reorient so that that same stretching compresses, and you have to keep track of the whole thing. But yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Um, to measure these now about Lagrangian uh, stretching uh, in this system. Okay, so then uh, about the same time that the, the those last couple of experiments were going on, um, I had left Bodenschaft's group and they had dropped the strip detectors as being too uh, quirky to keep running. And they uh, switched over to running these commercial cameras, which uh, by this point you could purchase cameras that were running at 27 kilohertz and um, acquired pixel frames at 256 by 256 pixels. Um, and so now you can do a lot of the measurements that we made before, but at higher seating densities. And uh, now, but this is a system that can access high Reynolds numbers. Notice that their spatial resolution is still pretty low. So uh, you are only going to be able to do a small part of the spatial length scales in this system for any one experiment. And what they've done is uh, chosen to break it up and look at uh, different ranges. The, um, the Lagrangian structure functions that I showed you uh, earlier today were measured with this apparatus. So I don't think I have any more data here to uh, show you from that apparatus. They chose to use three cameras. I think that's part of like cost thing. These were these are high, really high end cameras when they were purchased, and uh, and then two laser beams through to give a detection volume, illuminating all three of the cameras. Okay. So then uh, this is in Selman Warhoff's lab where they developed a system to track particles in a wind tunnel. So this is a technique that has been used um, before, but uh, this is the first time it's been used with high-speed cameras. So they set their camera here on a linear translation stage, and they run it at, uh, I think, uh, two meters per second with the mean flow of the wind along. They accelerate it up to the mean flow, then they move it along at uh, two meters per second to take the measurements, stop it, repeat, and collect statistics this way. So then you, now you can do many of the measurements that have been done before, except you can work in a wind tunnel, which allows you to have this very nice, clean, isotropic uh, decaying turbulence. And there have been quite a few groups, uh, some before and uh, since, who have been using this technique to try to transport the cameras with the mean flow um, to take out the mean flow. Notice that these Lagrangian particle tracking systems work best in systems where the mean velocity is very small. So you want to track your particles for as long as possible. And so you want a system where they stay in your detection volume as long as possible. If I go to a system where I have a large mean flow, then suddenly my particle disappears from my volume before I've been able to track it. And um, so you want to go into a frame of reference where the mean velocity is zero. And uh, so this kind of a system uh, has been developed and used quite widely. Uh, because if you've worked with these, it's quite a bit of work to get a linear stage to travel smoothly enough to allow you to do particle tracking. Remember, we're trying to measure positions in here to tens of microns. And vibrations introduced while this travels down the stage very easily introduce that kind of uh, measurement uncertainty due to vibrations of the camera. OK, so I thought, uh, any questions so far? I thought I would take a little bit of time and talk about the experimental problems that you run into when you do these kind of things that don't ever get published. The first one is that these systems are always stars for light. So we're doing volume imaging. That means we have to have a small aperture to have a large depth of field. And uh, so there we lose a lot of light. Um, and, so, and you also use very scary lasers. OK. <laughs> this is the solution to this. Um, we often use pulsed YAG lasers recently. Uh, in the past, we didn't. But now you have these pulsed YAG lasers that will give you 50 or even 100 watts average power in pulses of um, 200 nanoseconds. And they're very nice systems. You put a, a piece of wood in front of it, and immediately creates, creates a flame that comes out like, like a little. Uh, I think you can weld the laser like that. Too. Yeah, you focus them down. These are the kind of systems they use to weld, and you have to be careful. Um, but one of the one of the solutions is that we usually want to illuminate a volume, and uh, that causes us to lose a lot of light. But it also means that we don't have a, uh, a focused laser beam in very many places in the lab. Um, so I don't know of any problems, although I'm really very careful with the students to make sure we don't end up with an eye out because of the high, high uh, laser intensity we end up using for these. Um, okay, so another reason why the laser, why the, uh, your light has to be very intense is the particles need to be small enough to passively follow the flow. And so you like them as small as possible, and you make them as small as you can still see is usually what happens in practice. And then uh, finally, you're doing very high speed imaging. So the amount of time you have to collect light is uh, very short. All of this amounts to needing a lot of light. 
So I haven't done these experiments, but I, what happens with the temperature of the liquid? It's not a problem, and the reason is that the turbulence saves you. So turbulence is the world's best heat transport system, and so you're running intense turbulence, it effectively mixes any heat that you dissipate in the fluid very you're, quickly. You are changing the viscosity if you change the temperature, right? You would change the viscosity if you change the temperature, but the fluid's moving in a good fraction of a meter per second. So the amount of heat that gets dissipated in any one region where the laser is striking is really quite negligible. Would you cool your experiment? Yes, so you do have to cool the experiment. The reason you cool the experiment, though, is not because of the laser power that's dissipated in the system. Um, that's probably only tens of watts, it's probably Absolutely. even less than that. It's because you're dissipating energy due to the mechanical stirring of your system. And that dissipates a lot of energy, and so you have to cool and have to control those Absolutely. experiments, right? Yeah. Essentially. Right. Uh, plus, whatever gets dissipated in your seals and, uh, and this. But yeah, Epsilon is the way to think about that. The next thing is, um, you can never test a particle tracking system by writing a computer code that generates Gaussian spots on a black field. Um, it's been tried. It's, it's useful. I shouldn't say you, you can never do it. Just don't <coughs> trust it very much. And the reason is that experimental images are just always a lot messier than you get from Gaussian spots on a black field. There's always stray reflections in your experiment. There's always multiple reflections from your tracer particles. And this leads to interference patterns that um, can be quite complicated um, in, involved in the imaging. Um, sometimes, and Dan mentioned this yesterday, sometimes you get an exactly focused particle that only illumines one pixel. And you think that perfect focusing is a good thing, but that's bad because we measure the position of these particles to a tenth, even uh, sometimes uh, a twentieth of a pixel um, in these systems. And if suddenly my particle goes from being three pixels wide to being one pixel wide, suddenly my position accuracy goes from a twentieth of a pixel to one pixel, or maybe half a pixel, um, because I have no idea where it fell on that pixel if I only have one pixel eliminated. Um, so these kind of things you have to work out. Um, in, in Dan's experiment, where you have a a sheet, you can choose to defocus, right? Because all of your particles are in a specific plane. But in these 3D systems, you know, there's going to be particles wherever your best focus is. And uh, the solution here is usually to be sure that your particles are cover a few pixels when you just image a particle out. And if you use fluorescent particles, that's the easiest way um, to ensure that that happens. Although reflections, you can usually find ways to make that work. And then uh, at high sitting densities, the images of the particles overlap, so finding the positions in uh, the images. Um, can be quite uh, a challenge. Okay, there's one actually. That, uh, wow, did I miss a slide? Where is it? Yeah, I missed a slide. Um, it must have gotten deleted. So there's uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, one is that when you record data at 10 gigabytes a second or 1 gigabyte a second, um, you very quickly fill up whatever disk space you have available. And this is a theme that is, I think, has a bigger picture story for you about turbulence. So we, if you record the data at 10 gigabytes a second, you have a terabyte uh, drive, you've got 100 seconds of data that you can record from one camera, right? Um, so the, the data handling is a major issue in these experiments. It's the same problem that simulations run into. Whenever you have these systems with a large range of length scales, I did the calculation just yesterday for these 4,096 4, cube simulations if you take uh, one measurement every kilometer off time for one large eddy turnover time, you're a little over a petabyte of data to for one eddy turnover time in this system. And so what are you going to do with that? Well, in practice, what you do is you throw away most of it. And so this is a, a lesson in turbulence. You almost always are looking at some part of the, of the problem. You end up trying to break turbulence down into some part of the problem that you can look at because the whole problem is usually uh, unmanageable from a data management problem, uh, perspective. So you probably process, pre-process your data a lot more. Right? Yeah, I'm going to get to that a little bit. One of the methods we've developed um, to handle that is to do, put some pre-processing right on the cameras and uh, get rid of some of the data. I, and I had one nice funny line on my next slide that disappeared, which is that you should never underestimate the difficulty of plumbing. And you should never begrudge a plumber the amount they charge you for the work they do. because. <laughs> Um, when you set physicists to plumb, Shima's not laughing the loudest. Um, when you set physicists to plumb, there are problems. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. You can try it yourself um, as, as you want. So here's some recent developments um, in uh, 
in particle tracking in turbulence. Um, and uh, one of the cool ones that uh, the Tom Francois group has been doing, although there are a couple other groups who are doing it for different applications, is to build particles that have sensors inside of them. I think they've been using acceleration and pressure sensors, although they, I think they have some others also. Uh, temperature, probably, for sure. And then you just put a radio in the particle and transmit the data out um, to you in real time. I mean, why not, right? This was what they did with the balloons in the atmospheric boundary layer back in the 80s. Of course, there you could make your thing this size, and here you'd like to make it um, tens or hundreds of microns. In practice, they're down to a little less than a centimeter for a particle that they can make uh, neutrally buoyant in uh, liquid and, um, and then uh, have it uh, just radio out to them what the acceleration and pressure is. I think there's a lot of future for this because currently they're using um, you know, macroscopically fabricated uh, sensors and uh, you know, independently fabricated sensors and then constructing it macroscopically into their one centimeter piece. And when you can get to the point that you can integrate the whole thing on a single monolithic uh, piece of silicon, I think that there's a good chance that these things are going to be down in the uh, 100 micron uh, or 500 micron range um, at some point. Um, maybe, maybe it'll be a few millimeters. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot you can do uh, when you can measure that. In particular, this pressure thing gets uh, short shrift in these discussions. And the reason is because nobody can measure it. Um, Dan says you know, measure pressure, and I agree in some sense. But if you put a probe in your flow and you want to measure the, probe, the pressure somewhere other than at the surface, that probe has a um, Bernoulli pressure just due to the velocity moving past it. And what you measure is, becomes a velocity and not a pressure. Um, you can still get fluctuations and you can find ways to measure the velocity along with the pressure and extract some things. People have worked on that. But uh, it's very hard to measure pressure in a flow. And the real way to do pressure inside is with a Lagrangian particle. And these instrumented particles are really the only uh, effective way I know. Some people have used pressure sensitive dyes um, invected in flows. And um, they're they can do some things, although the range of pressure sensitivity is still relatively small compared to what we need for um, laboratory flows. So another thing that a couple of groups have been working on is marked particles, where you take a particle and put patterns on its surface that allow you to extract the orientation in addition to position, so you can measure um, vorticity, the rotation of the particle. Um, that's been done two different ways. The uh, home group, I guess, I'm referring to here, and then the Bodenschutz group, they have uh, made these uh, index match particles that have fluorescent tracers embedded inside of them. And then you track it just like other tracers. So you have many tracers in your flow, and then you, a few other tracers, you can't tell the difference from your experimental measurements, except that some of them are locked because they're part of a piece of plastic to move together with that sphere. And then you can use just your particle tracking measurements to extract the uh, motion of, these, um, of the sphere. I think there's a lot of potential for uh, some of these measurements in the next few years. And I can't uh, uh, discuss uh, things that are coming along without mentioning the new gripping and turbulence facility that has been built. This is a recirculating um, wind tunnel that has two test sections that they can use in the bottom and the top, and uh, that has um, pressurized sulfur hexafluoride in it that uh, allows you then to have a wind tunnel with Taylor Reynolds numbers here up well into the atmospheric uh, turbulence range. Um, so there's a, a lot of interesting things here. Although the instrumentation is a real challenge. They, since it's a wind tunnel, if you want to do particle tracking, you have to have something that moves with the mean flow. So they built a sled in here that uh, moves four high-speed cameras at five meters per second um, uh, through the uh, chamber. I've seen the sled move, although I haven't seen any data with some cameras attached to it. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to seeing some high Reynolds number particle tracking data coming out of this over the next few years. Yeah, looks expensive. Yes, probably not too much worse than a three meter tank of liquid sodium. Um, but uh, <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. Maybe if you, it may be about the same number in euros that you're using yes. dollars. <laughs> okay, and then I just wanted to mention that uh, a couple of commercial systems have come out uh, in the last five or eight years that do this kind of stereoscopic particle tracking. CSI had the first one. They have three cameras that are rigidly mounted onto a frame to avoid the calibration problems that are the, uh, the nightmare of people who want to use this without thinking about it all very much. Um, and, uh, and so this system will allow you to get uh, three-dimensional three particle positions. But uh, the cameras are relatively low frame rate, so it's not very useful for the kind of things that I like to do. Um, a more competitive uh, application that has come out more recently is uh, these Como PID systems. 
which as far as I can tell is a different name for the same system. They set up multiple cameras uh, imaging a, a lumen volume inside of the system. But they use a significantly different image analysis technique, which is instead of using particle finding on the 2D images and then using intersection of rays to find the particle positions in 3D, they do a tomographic reconstruction of the image from multiple cameras to uh, reconstruct the intensity field in 3D voxel space. Does that make sense? Are people somewhat familiar with how tomographic PIV works? I see a couple of no's. Or tom tom tomography in general works. So when they do a CAT scan of you, computed tomography, right? What do they do? There's a X-ray, usually it's a sheet, isn't it? That uh, scans through and comes through at all angles. And what you can do is if you measure the absorption of the X-rays in this case, at all angles, then you can reconstruct from that, it's just a linear algebra problem, to reconstruct what the absorption in each of the three-dimensional box, each of the voxels in three-dimensional space must be. And that's how they create the CT scans that they'll use to, uh, to for medical purposes. Um, so here, you can't do it quite as nicely because you don't have time to scan a system around and measure the turbulent flow. And so they use just four cameras. Your reconstruction in the voxel space is not as good, but uh, if you're careful, you can still get a reasonable 3D reconstruction of the intensity being scattered from each point, and then you do your particle finding in 3D. Um, my calculations say that the ultimate limits for this should be the same as the ultimate limits for the stereo matching, but we're currently in the process of sorting out exactly which method is the most straightforward. And whichever one can, we conclude works the best, everyone can convert because the physical system is the same. It's just the data processing algorithms that have to be reworked. I guess the one difference is you, if you pay them several hundred thousand dollars, they'll give you one. Whereas ours, we have to build from scratch. Oh, you know what? Somehow this just got it at the wrong place. I was telling you, I, this slide disappeared somewhere. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, this just got messed up. Let's skip what I already said what I wanted to say. Okay, now I want to spend a little bit of time on um, a recent method we've developed in our group for uh, handling the huge data streams that come in in these systems. So here's a typical image of a relatively low C density data that we take in our system. So you can see the particles there on a black background. And you're recording a few gigabytes a second of these. Uh, I think in our cameras are a little bit less than one gigabyte a second with the current system cameras we have, but the high high-end cameras are up to 10 gigabytes a second, and you really don't want most of that data. It's almost all black zeros. You really only want to know where these particles are. So it's a natural application to use some kind of real-time image compression. And so the system we have used is to put a uh, digital circuit between the camera and the device that's storing your images that simply picks out the brightness and the position of each pixel that is above the threshold and stores it. And we get compression factors of about 100 um, just with that very simple algorithm. And one of the biggest advantages of this is that when you have this several gigabytes a second data stream, you really, it's very expensive to get um, data storage mechanisms that will accept that stream continuously. Whereas once you've divided it by 100, it'll go on to a normal hard drive. And so our data acquisition time went from about seven seconds, which then you'd have to wait five minutes to download data and then repeat, up to continuous recording. And you fill a hard drive in about seven days with uh, the new system. So uh, this, this system, a very simple, um, Compression works very nicely, although of course the details are that the data coming off of this camera is very high uh, data stream, and you have to build a system that can interface with those high speed digital circuits. So there's some digital electronics required um, to build this kind of system, and we had uh, quite a bit of fun building it. Here's the way it works the heart of our system is an uh, image compression circuit, I mean, the heart of our system is a field programmable gate array. These are digital circuits that you can program with software to create any digital circuit you want, and they'll run at a few hundred megahertz. We only need 66 megahertz in this system, and uh, to stream the data through and pick out the bright places in real time. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. And uh, let's skip the summary, because I don't think I can really adequately summarize. Anybody questions about the experimental methods? I'm going to then spend the last 35 minutes or so um, discussing some uh, measurements of non-tracer particle turbulence. Rather than putting away all the intensities below 100, did you consider just lowering the bit depth to which you measured them? So instead of measuring for like the nearest one, you measure the nearest four. And then you like you don't have to throw away all your low intensity data. And you just need to do slightly Right. Lower. 
So if, if I understand right, I'm not sure I understand right, but if I were to get rid of all except one bit on uh, all of the pixels, I would be left with a factor of eight compression. Is that, is that right? Uh, yeah, if you took just one bit away, if you took two bits away, so like divided all of them by four and rounded, then you'd have a factor of... No, he's getting rid of seven bits and keeping one. If I get rid of seven <laughs> bits and keep one, then I have a factor of eight compression. Right. And we're aiming for a factor of a hundred. Um, so you kind of have to throw away some of them. Now, where you're headed is a good direction, because our algorithm clearly has a problem, in that um, by setting a threshold, you, you know, you, you're missing the pixels that are just below threshold that are part of your particle that would allow you to more accurately find the position. And so the ways we've been doing this is with some kind of nearest neighbor algorithms. Although it turned out to be relatively hard to do this. It's easy to look at an image and pick out the nearest neighbor. But when the data is streaming in serially, line by line, picking out nearest neighbors requires you to archive the data and be able to come back and process it. Uh, and so real-time processing is always a different game than, uh, than uh, processing a stored image. But you're headed in the direction of the kind of things that you definitely want to do. Anybody else? Let's go on then and we'll talk briefly about... This is my second uh, laser pointer. <laughs> the stick is the backup plan. Oh, there, no. Just the finger is the backup plan for the backup plan. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I want to talk briefly about motion of non-tracer particles in turbulence. And uh, this is one of these problems that we had in the back of our mind when we were first starting to do these techniques. But uh, it's really turned out to be, in many ways, a more fruitful problem than the uh, high Reynolds number uh, uh, small-scale scaling uh, things that I talked about uh, initially. The theory is not nearly as clean, but the, um, the range of applications and the range of very fascinating physics that exists in this problem of non-tracer particles in turbulence is, uh, is very interesting. So with only a short time, and I have, I'm not the uh, uh, great expert on anything except uh, these particles here, I want to give a survey of some more of what's going on. I wanted to uh, highlight one of the very important problems. So actually, I should give you my phase diagram first. So this is a phase diagram to represent the kind of particles that you want to, that you might want to uh, track in turbulence. So here I'm plotting the particle density divided by the fluid density, and here's the particle size. So tracer particles are neutrally buoyant and small. If I have large particles, I mean if I have heavy particles that are still small, these are things like clouds and um, uh, sediments, in, uh, in water systems. If I have light particles, these are bubbles, which could be a wide range of scales, and I haven't included some other parameters that exist, like the deformability, um, of, that become important for these bubbles. But when bubbles are small, they are quite like um, small spheres that uh, are of lo density lower than the fluid. And then uh, up here we have large neutrally buoyant particles, and you could of course have uh, large light or large heavy particles also. One of the places where people have been most interested in understanding these non-tracer particles is out here in this regime, because this is the dynamics of clouds. You have a water droplet in air, that's what a cloud, and uh, we want to understand the motion of water droplets in air. Um, and one of the reasons driving it is that um, it's one of the largest sources of uncertainty in our predictions of climate change. Uh, when people say, as the temperature goes up, I mean, uh, as the CO2 goes up, how much is the temperature going to rise? And one of the biggest uncertainties is how much is the cloud cover going to increase and decrease the uh, albedo, I guess they call it, of the Earth, causing more heat to uh, be radiated from the clouds. Um, and this requires us to understand cloud physics. So, and one of the very more direct unsolved problems in clouds is how water droplets in clouds rapidly grow from about 10 microns. They grow up to this size by condensation. Um, and then they have often a relatively uniform size distribution, about 10 microns. But then somehow they have to grow about one millimeter where they'll fall as rain. There are many, uh, uh, system, many situations in which this happens in 15, 30 minutes. And current models don't predict nearly the, uh, the correct rate for this process of droplet coalescence in, uh, in clouds. And people are, um, many people believe that droplet collisions are the growth mechanism and turbulence is a major factor in uh, controlling the droplet uh, collision rate. Now to see why that might be, let's look at, um, well, let me first introduce the equations, and we'll see why uh, turbulence can lead to enhanced droplet collisions in clouds. So if you want to describe the motion of a spherical droplet 
in Stokes' flow, what's the equation? Initially, I think I can write that down, right? I need Stokes' drag and maybe a, uh, a difference due to the density of the particle. And I'm entirely wrong. What about the Flaxen correction? Yeah, what about the Flaxen correction? <laughs> exactly. This is the kind of questions you get when the physicist goes to the fluid dynamics meeting and talks about these things. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, you did? Very nice. So you can uh, uh, lead us through here. So this is, the, this is a version of the accepted equation for the motion of a spherical particle in Stokes flow. No turbulence at all here. Um, we're in, we have uh, Stokes flow, uh, low Reynolds number flow around a spherical particle, and this is the acceleration of the particle. Here's the uh, effect of gravity due to the mass difference of the particle on the fluid that it displays. Here is the uh, fact that the, there's some acceleration, some pressure field accelerating the fluid, and the particle is going to accelerate at a different rate. Here's the term that we would have all expected. This is the Stokes drag. Mu is their viscosity here, and uh, so this is the drag just due to the Stokes, the laminar Stokes flow around the sphere. And then we have these two messy terms left. This one is an added mass term, because when a particle changes its velocity, it changes the amount of fluid it's dragging along with it. And so um, you have to account for that added mass. And then what's worse is that you also have to keep track of the history of the difference between the particle and the fluid because the boundary layer outside of the particle takes some time to grow and you uh, may need to keep track of uh, the history of how that boundary layer has developed. So it's a very complicated problem. Um, fortunately for particles with a large density difference like water droplets in clouds, um, the only terms that matter are the external force, the, uh, the uh, acceleration of the fluid, and the Stokes drag, exactly the terms that a physicist would like to have. And these terms, although you have to be careful, you can't always ignore them, they're quite small compared to the others. So it's a question either for you, Greg, or for I because I actually don't have a good sense. How certain are we that this equation and each and every one of those terms are precisely correct? Mm -hmm. So, read my 2007 and these are Okay. Lots of 50 pages of the physics and everything. So, the, so one of the things that, that worries me about that question also is that there are now a growing number of papers being published about particle motion and superfluid helium. And they assume some equations without any critical analysis of whether those equations may or may not be the correct ones. Let me just say that, that um, there is a, a lot of debate about these equations. And it sounds like uh, I, I don't, I'm not actually aware of uh, you, a recent review paper you wrote on this problem. I, I will definitely uh, read it. Um, very good. So, um, but the, the thing I think that can be said for sure is that the experiments agree with uh, these uh, results because the main terms are relatively simple ones. And the, uh, the disagreement is often about the form to use for these vaccine corrections and um, how, you, how you sample some of these um, fluid velocities um, around the particle. Um, at least at the level I have gotten into that. Okay, so in this simple case, you only need one non-dimensional parameter to, des to describe the motion of the uh, particle in this system, the Stokes number, which is uh, proportional to the diameter of the particle divided by your, uh, the Kolmogorov scale, um, if you're using turbulence. Usually they think about it as a particle response time over a turbulence, over the fluid time, um, and that turns into a particle diameter divided by a uh, uh, Kolmogorov scale times a density factor. And that greatly simplifies your problem because you only have one non-dimensional parameter rather than the two that uh, exist in this more general phase diagram. Okay? And then here's the kind of results that people get when they simulate the uh, particle with that equation of motion in homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Um, there are experimental data, but it's not quite as uh, pretty to show in a short amount of time I wanted to spend on this. So here's what happens if you have neutral particles and they're uniformly spread throughout. The fact that you see lighter concentration here simply means that you're looking for fewer particles. Um, and these are uniformly spread throughout this periodic box. When the particles are lighter than the fluid, what happens? So I have a pressure field, and the particles get sucked to the regions of low pressure, which in turbulence tend to be the vortex cores. 
and vorticity, vorticity and turbulence is configured in uh, tubes. Um, and so you can have your particles c concentrated on tube-like structures when they are lighter than the fluid. When they're heavier than the fluid, you also get a preferential concentration phenomenon. The uh, geometry of this is quite a bit more complicated to understand, but uh, the concentration in uh, high concentration regions can be three times what it is in uh, low concentration regions for, us, uh, for particles that are on the scale of um, on the Stokes number one, which uh, does exist some, in some kind of cloud phenomena, although many clouds are at yet lower Stokes number where the preferential concentration is not as quite as uh, strong as they choose for these simulations here. So preferential concentration is an important phenomena, and this immediately couples into the cloud problem, because if the turbulence is causing my water droplets to have big variation in their concentration, now suddenly that's going to change my collision frequency quite a lot, because collision frequency goes like the density squared of the particle. Is there a question? Um, so here are we completely neglecting any correlations between the particles? Or? Correlations between the particles. So um, in the sense of the, this simulation ignores, and, and these equations also, um, ignore the two-way coupling, meaning we don't worry about the interaction of the particle back with the fluid, which then that fluid that has been changed by the particle will change the next particle. That's one kind of interaction between the particles. And then also you can have particles that simply collide with each other without being mediated by the fluid. Um, but for small particles, when you have Stokes flow around them, that very rarely happens. Right? You have to get up to quite dense particles before um, the lubrication forces are not going to be large enough to push the particle apart. But in any case, the two-way coupling is an issue, and these simulations are done without two-way coupling. One of the important reasons why you need to do experiments. And I'm not, uh, I'm not showing you many of the experiments here. Um, a lot of the experiments done with the um, cameras that move down the wind tunnels are then used for water droplets in, uh, in air to allow them to study the, the dynamics of these water droplets in turbulence. So uh, we've looked at acceleration, so I thought that that would be a good quantity to, uh, to get some insight about the way the um, particle density changes the dynamics of the particles. So here's the PDF of tracer particles, which is very similar to our experimentally measured one. And here's the PDF of these heavy particles. And they have less intermittency. There are less probabilities of rare events, although it still has this stretched exponential form. Um, and they're finding a very little Stokes number dependence in this range of Stokes numbers between 0.09 and 0.16 that they showed in, uh, in this simulation. These are simulations by Tosky et al. Did I uh, include this uh, reference here? Sorry about that. I missed that. Um, Federico Kosky has uh, um, done many of these simulations. Uh, here's a, a sense of how things uh, depend on Stokes number to give you a sense of the physics involved in this problem. So here's now the ARMS divided by the Kolmogorov prediction. So this is A0 in the coordinates I was using before. Here for tracer particles they have 1.7, which is a fair bit less than the values of 6. We were finding higher Reynolds numbers, but we understand that. These simulations are at our lambda 250, where the A0 is about 1.8. So this is the tracer particle acceleration. And now what happens as you increase the density of the particles? The acceleration rapidly falls off, as you might expect. And there's two phenomena that are uh, responsible for that. One of them is that uh, a tracer particle at the position of the heavy particle would have less acceleration than a randomly chosen tracer particle. Does that make sense? This is a preferential sampling issue. The uh, tracer part, the heavy particles are being preferentially concentrated in regions with smaller accelerations. And that's the big effect here at low Stokes number, is that the, um, the accelerations are decreasing because the particles are slowly drifting into regions with lower acceleration. Once you get out to much heavier particles, now then, um, the particles start to actually filter the flow. So they're falling through the eddies faster than the, um, than the particles able to respond and accelerate up to the local fluid velocity. So you're just getting an acceleration that is less than the uh, acceleration of a fluid particle at the position of the particle. And those two effects combine to give the full um, acceleration of these particles as a function of Stokes number. 
And this, these are the kind of quantities that people want to understand because it's the accelerations of these particles that come into determining collision rates um, and estimating the rates at which these droplets are going to grow in the clouds. Okay, so then uh, another question is what happens when the particles are large and neutrally buoyant? So up here in this region, this region happens to be easier for us to access experimentally because once we go to heavy particles, they very rapidly fall to the bottom of the chamber. So if they're small enough not to fall to the bottom of the chamber, we can't see them. They don't scatter enough light to our cameras. And if they are, um, and by the time they get big enough to see, and they're still heavy enough to have interesting weight dynamics, they fall out of our flow, and we can't see them. So these are the things that we focus on experimentally, um, these uh, physics of large, neutrally buoyant particles. Fortunately, there's a nice connection of the dynamics of these large, uh, neutrally buoyant particles with uh, the Kolmogorov theory that we've spent some time on here this week. Um, and the point is that if I have a large particle in turbulent flow, it's going to average over the fluid flow. The simplest model is to say that the acceleration of a, of a large particle should be the average acceleration of the fluid particles that it has displaced. Okay? Now that model is not going to be exactly right. But it's a place to go, and particularly if you're trying to do dimensional analysis, it probably gives you the right scaling. So the question is then, what happens if we average the acceleration over all the eddies smaller than the size of the particle? So you effectively get the acceleration of the particle is equal to the acceleration of the fluid at the scale of the particle diameter. Well, you can do a simple non-dimensional analysis. Just say that there is an acceleration. In this case, we'll look at the acceleration variance, because that's one of the most direct things to measure. And we want to say, how does that depend on the two parameters in the problem? If we're in the inertial range, we have a particle diameter, and we have an energy dissipation rate, and the only combination of those that gives me acceleration squared has this diameter to the minus two-thirds scaling. So we'll increase the particle diameter and see whether we get um, a Kolmogorov scaling in an in inertial range um, for these large particles now in turbulence. So here's a set of data we published a few years back um, with the acceleration variance on this uh, axis, plotted against the particle size divided by the Kolmogorov length on this axis. Here, um, this is the tracer particles coming in at approximately six. As we go to larger particles, the, uh, the, these large particles start to average over the smallest eddies in the turbulent flow, and so your accelerations uh, start to be smaller. And the fall off here quite nicely follows this uh, inertial range prediction of d to the minus two thirds. So here's a case where the uh, Kolmogorov theory also works uh, relatively well in predicting this, um, this size scaling of the acceleration variance of these uh, large particles. Um, there have been several measurements of this, and I just have combined them all into this one plot. Um, to, and they agree quite well, giving the uh, functional form of this acceleration variance of the functional particle size. Okay, so there's lots that can be talked about, about these experiments and, and limitations on them and the like. But I think we've pretty well uh, gotten a handle on this. Uh, actually, I wanted to show this pair of this data that just came out. Oh, the dates are gone. You can see up there, this is a, this is a journal fluid mechanics article that just came out a couple months ago uh, when uh, Jean-Francois's uh, group um, figured out a way to use a laser Doppler system to make these measurements of the accelerations of large particles. And they have found a very, occur very uh, similar to what we have with smaller error bars. And they're claiming now that they can actually see intermittency corrections to the, uh, to the inertial range scaling here. So this dotted line is the, the d to the minus 2 thirds scaling that we argued for. And uh, then they, they clearly deviate from that down here. And they're claiming that that might be an intermittency correction. We'll see how that, uh, that idea pans out. But it's very intriguing that so we might be able to see intermittency dynamics in the dynamics of large inertial particles. Um, okay, and uh, I've got 12 minutes left, and I uh, thought I would um, wrap up by telling about some recent measurements that Shima's been making. So she gave her eight minute talk about the, her earlier paper, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of the preliminary stuff that uh, she has been working on. Um, now, instead of tracking uh, particles, now tracking rods in three dimensional turbulence. So there's a lot of applications that, uh, um, in which you'd like to understand the motion of rods. So paper making is one of the classic examples that, where you need to use turbulence to randomly align fibers before you press it to make paper. Um, clouds are not only water droplets. Many clouds are ice crystals. And ice crystals are not spheres. 
Um, they will often be plates or, um, or rods, and the dynamics of those are interesting in, uh, as well. And uh, rods are often used for drag reduction. Polymers give a slightly larger effect for drag reduction, but rods have the big advantage that you can filter them out of the flow afterwards. So people are uh, interested just with mechanical filters rather than having to do something chemical. And uh, so people are interested in understanding the motion of rods and turbulence as a drag reduction mechanism. So rod rotation rate is determined by the velocity gradient. So this comes back to something from our uh, couple of different experimental techniques we mentioned. People are trying to find ways to get access to the small scales in these turbulent flows while also resolving large scales. And one way to go about it is to get a particle that responds to the small scale velocity gradients that you can measure with only having one of them in view. If you have to measure the small scales by having many particles across a Kolmogorov scale, and you have a large range of scales, so it's high Reynolds number, then your experiment is a soup. Does that make sense? If I have a large number of particles in every Kolmogorov scale, I have to have uh, hundreds of Kolmogorov scales in order to have high Reynolds numbers, and I try to look in, I simply can't uh, optically see into such a flow. But if you get a particle that itself responds to the velocity gradients, then I can use low densities. I just need one of them in my view, and I can get information out about the velocity gradients. So this is also an old problem. Jeffrey in 1922 had already worked out how to relate the rotation rate of a rod to the, uh, the, to the symmetric, uh, anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor here, the vorticity tensor, and to the strain tensor. Sij, and uh, so we do a little bit of tensor analysis. This alpha is the aspect ratio of the rods, and uh, so if we know the rotation rate, we don't know the velocity gradients, but we know something about the velocity gradients. And uh, one of the things we're working on is what exactly can we conclude about the velocity gradients from measurements of uh, the rotation rate of the rods. Okay, so here's our apparatus. This is actually the first time I've shown you my apparatus at Westland. We have, uh, similar to what I've shown you before, two oscillating grids that create a relatively homogeneous turbulence uh, here in the center region. And then we use four cameras to image uh, a volume there. And uh, at uh, typical uh, parameters, we're running at R lambda 285 with a Kolmogorov scale here of 140 microns. Um, I, this, this is the properties of the flow. Um, I, somebody mentioned about characterizing flows. It's one of the things that's a lot of work and you don't get a lot of credit for, but you do have to go in and say, um, what is the mean velocity in your flow? And it's not zero. You look at this and you think, oh, that should have zero mean velocity because these uh, grids are oscillating up and down. But the boundary layers here at the side create streaming flows that uh, create a significant non-zero velocity in this thing. And uh, here's what it looks like. We're going to be making measurements in the center region where that mean velocity is almost zero. And we're also going to be in the center region where the velocity variance doesn't depend much on spatial position. So we have a homogeneous flow with nearly mean velocity, but a small mean velocity gradient. And we're going to be tracking rods there in, uh, in that central region. So here's what an image looks like of rods. And as I said, we put low densities in. Um, largely, this is because uh, she was very patient, but not infinitely patient. We've only found how to make these rods by cutting them by hand. And uh, so we have 300 gallons of fluid, and we need to get some rods into a uh, five centimeter uh, on a side uh, detection volume, and while well, we succeeded in getting one or two in the volume at one time, just how many we were willing to take the time to cut. Um, so then we, um, we stain the dye with the, the rods with a fluorescent dye, um, and then we take images of them. One of the interesting challenges here, since this talk is primarily about experimental techniques, is here I have a 2D image of a rod, and what can I, how can I extract the three dimensional orientation of this rod from multiple images of this? It's really quite straightforward. Just like there's a camera somewhere that has a ray, and I know that the rod lies somewhere along this ray, there's an orientation of the rod that tells me that the axis of the rod lies somewhere in this plane. So now if I have another camera that tells me that the axis of the rod lies somewhere in some other plane, now the intersection of those two planes gives me the orientation along which the rod lies. This is the reason why we chose rods. Plates are equally interesting from a physics perspective. Um, but they're much harder to do experimentally because you can't do this simple two um, orthogonal imaging um, picking out the, uh, the orientation of a plate. Um, but sometime we will figure out how to track plates in these systems as well. Okay, and then here's what you get after uh, a fair bit of image analysis. Um, here's the XYZ positions of the rods. And here now is the 
um, three components of a unit vector along the orientation of the rod. And the only thing I want you to see here is that the velocity has uh, relatively um, slow dynamics, whereas the rotation rate has much faster dynamics. And that is reflecting a property of turbulence, that this velocity is dominated by the large scales, whereas the velocity gradients, which determine the rotation rate of the rods, are dominated by the small scales. And the small scales have much faster time scales associated with them than the large scales do. So you expect um, faster time dynamics in these, um, in these orientation coordinates than we do in the position coordinates. Okay? We're coming down to the end of the day. Everybody's uh, uh, tired, but hopefully you're, uh, this is in, uh, interesting stuff worth a little bit more time. Here's a probability density of the rod velocity. And uh, you can see this is preliminary data. We don't have, this goes down to 10 to the minus 3. I've been showing you PDFs going down to 10 to the minus 7. Um, but, uh, but, so we have three coordinates, and when you look at that for a little bit, the first thing you notice is that the z velocity is shifted off to negative velocities. That's an experimental artifact, if you uh, uh, think about that. That's because we have not yet density matched our rods. And there's a nightmare that I haven't mentioned to any of you yet, which is that when you do this kind of particle tracking, you want tracer particles, but you can never buy particles that match your fluid. So you have to do something, and you try to get them small enough so that the density difference doesn't matter. In this case, our density difference is 15%, and uh, so they, these uh, particles are actually settling out in the z direction. So we would take data for a little while, then stir them back out with violent uh, stirring, and then take data again, and that's why our statistics are limited um, for this case. But this is preliminary data, and we already have some very interesting results here. Here's the rotation rate of these rods, and we get our, my favorite probability distribution this, uh, now of the rotation rate, which is going to be related to the velocity gradients, so you naturally expect it to have these long tails on it. And we haven't yet um, gotten enough resolution to compare how the tails here compare with the acceleration and the velocity gradients. It looks like it's a little stronger than the velocity gradients. We have some ideas why, but um, I don't want to really go into the details. OK, given the time, I am not going to go through this. Um, let me just uh, briefly outline what's going on here. So this is that equation I showed you about how we can relate the uh, rotation rate of rods to the vorticity tensor and the strain rate tensor. And we can use this, plus some definitions and assumptions of isotropy, to relate the second moment of the rod rotation rate to the energy dissipation rate in the flow. Now this is nice. So you've heard a lot about the energy dissipation rate. Experimentally, it's quite hard to measure. What people actually do, I probably should have made that one of my slides in here, I didn't think about it, uh, one of my sections, I could have talked about ways to measure the energy dissipation rate. What people typically do is they look for some of these Kolmogorov laws that have an energy dissipation rate in it, and somebody else has measured the constant of uh, the proportionality constant, or they use the one in which we know the constant from the four-fifths law to extract this energy dissipation rate. But here we have a way in which a single particle measurement, uh, the, we need just statistics of the rotation rate of rods, allows us to get access to the energy dissipation rate. So we know the energy dissipation rate in our flow from a, a variety of measurements we've made previously. The question is, how good does this do? And uh, here's some results. Here's the prediction up here, 0.28 in these units of epsilon on nu, 0.27 I guess I had. And here is our measurement on top of some simulations by Shin and Koch um, from some years ago, and very low Reynolds numbers but uh, it seems to give a pretty good uh, representation of what's going on. And here's a fascinating bit of physics, and that is that these rods are being controlled by the small scales in the turbulent flow, and yet, and isotropy and all that, you'd like to say that rods are randomly oriented, but they're nowhere near randomly oriented after they're advected by the flow for a little bit. If you think about that for a little bit, you'll realize why it is. So if you put particles randomly in the flow, they go any orientation, you, if you let them travel with the flow for a little bit, the strain rate aligns the particles with the strain. And now you lose the rotation rate due to the strain after they're aligned. That make sense? So randomly, uh, let me say uh, again. So imagine I have the simplest case of a uniform strain field. If I randomly put particles in a uniform strain field, they'll initially start to rotate with a rotation rate that is given by, well, you could use the uh, the equation, the Jeffrey equation, to calculate the rotation rate and strain. Now, I let the particle advect along. It's going to align with the extensional direction of the strain, and pretty soon this, the rotation rate is zero. 
Okay, so particles that have been allowed to align with the flow have very different rotation rate statistics than particles that are placed randomly. And uh, if you do a numerical simulation of the statistics you get, here is the result you have. They do it as a function of rod length. And here's our one data point we have so far at the rod length that we have. And it agrees very nicely with the rods that are already aligned with the flow. So uh, now back to my original point, we'd like to use this to measure the energy dissipation rate. Um, and now we just have to calibrate. Um, we have something that's proportional to the energy dissipation rate. We just have to know what this curve is um, at the Reynolds number we're looking at. And then we can use these statistics of broad rotation rate to extract the energy dissipation rate in the flow from a single particle measurement. So there's a bunch of things that need to be considered that have to be worked out before Shima gets her PhD. <coughs> but I think I'm going to wrap up at that point. Have a conversation with Shima about this. Um, this has been her life for the last uh, two months. Um, so yeah, this is the obvious thing to do. This was preliminary data we took, um, just putting the plastic rods in the flow. Um, experimentally, putting high concentration solutions in your flow are a problem. Getting 15% density change with sucrose um, gives you a somewhat non-Newtonian fluid, as I understand it. If some of you have uh, more uh, experience with that and it would be okay, I'd be happy to use it, but I'm afraid that people would be concerned about 15% concentration, 15% density change due to sucrose. So we've chosen to go with salt solutions, um, and calcium chloride will easily give you 15%. The problem is that this creates a great big electrolytic mess um, and when you put 15% calcium chloride solutions in your apparatus. And we tried to build it so that it had only one metal and plastic to minimize all of these things, but you know, chemistry is a beast. And, uh, and so we're having problems with corrosion and these kind of things. And then the other problem we ran into was that after we changed the index so that our rods were neutrally buoyant, the tracer particles we got at that same density uh, disappeared because there was, the index of refraction got too close. Um, so these are the kind of problems we work out, and I'm just confident she will have them worked out in a few months. But you're exactly right, this is the way to do it. Uh, the rods are very hard to change, um, but you can change the fluid uh, with pretty good precision. More questions? Go on once. Go on twice. Okay. Thank you, Greg.